Can 100 million Christians in America and 345,000 churches still make a difference in our culture? Can the church still impact the nation and the world? That's what we'll talk about on this edition of The Alex McFarland Show. Stay tuned. You know, I came across something in Scripture the other day that I had never noticed before I was reading in the Old Testament. And in 2 Kings and 2 Samuel, it talks about the Mount of Corruption. And I thought, you know, there's so many mountains in Scripture. There's Mount Sinai. There's Mount Calvary. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different mountains. I'd never seen the phrase, the Mount of Corruption, and I was doubly surprised when I began to do some study and I saw what that mountain really is because it's in the New Testament. Now this mountain, the Mount of Corruption, is only mentioned twice in the Old Testament, but it's mentioned a dozen times in the New Testament. You know it as the Mount of Olives. Isn't that amazing? This mountain where the Lord Jesus would so often go, the Mount of Olives. In fact, in Zechariah, it tells us that Christ will return to the Mount of Olives. In Acts chapter 1, one day Christ will descend from heaven. He'll come back and he'll stand again on the Mount of Olives. Well, at the base of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. And of course, you know, so many times the Lord would go there to pray. And the night before he was arrested and ultimately crucified, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of the Mount of Olives. Now, this is significant because olives were crushed to make olive oil. And the oil is very often pictured as the Holy Spirit, the the oil of the, the Holy Spirit. Now, what happened? It was the Mount of Corruption because during the time of Solomon, Solomon built idols, pagan shrines there because he was trying to placate all of the hundreds of wives he took that were, quote, strange women. Now, think about this. Under Solomon, it was a place of dead idols. But under Jesus, the Mount of Olives, it was a place of a living Savior. Under Solomon, that mountain represented corruption. Under Jesus, it represented cleansing. Under Solomon, it represented compromise. Under Jesus, that mountain represented commitment to God's will. Under Solomon, the Mount of Corruption represented satanic deception, but Jesus, the Mount of Olives, represented God's revelation. Under the pagan idols and disobedience and unbelief, the Mount of Corruption, it represented sin and the flesh, but under Jesus, the Mount of Olives, it represented righteousness and grace. Well, do you know what? When we come back, we've got a conversation with our very dear friend, E.W. Jackson, who's running for president. And we're going to talk about the question, can the church again be engaged to call our nation from lawlessness and destruction back to the solid rock? of morality and truth. Folks, we have been like the Mount of Olives, a place of grace and truth. I would say we're in a state of corruption because we've deviated from God's truth, God's will, and our national destiny. Stay tuned. We're going to come back. We'll talk about this and much more with E.W. Jackson. Don't go away. This is John. He's 21. He's never met Jesus. It's possible he never will. He's already formed his beliefs. His heart is hard. He no longer believes God is good. How do you change his future? Let's go back in time to when John was a child. So let's find his public school 
and establish a Bible club down the hall. There, someone introduces him to Jesus, who takes his life in a new direction. John's so excited, he tells his friends, one of them comes to Christ. His mother sees the change in his life. When he asks to go to church, she comes too, and she comes to Christ. And it all began in a public school good news club. And this is how you change the future. Welcome back to the program. You know, it's always a great day when we can visit with our friend, attorney, pastor, presidential candidate to uh, Bishop E.W. Jackson. He's with us now to talk further about the question of can the church in America still be used by God to impact our culture? Well, Pastor Jackson, attorney, author, broadcaster, and now also presidential candidate. I know you're busy. I want to say thank you very much for making time to be with us today. Well, thank you for having me, Alex. It's my pleasure. Well, I, I want to talk about the church, and you and I both have pastored, and so that's something we know a lo little bit about. But I want to hear about your campaign. You, This is the, the most gutsy, courageous thing. You're running for president. What, what's, what's going on, my friend? Well, you know, Alex, I, I appreciate that. But, you know, it, it's like Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. When you know that God... Is, is really commanding you to do something, then it's just a question of, am I going to be obedient or not? And of course, you know, for people who might hear that and go, oh, what is, what is he saying? God told him to do it. Well, we know God didn't knock on my door and say, listen, let me come, come in and sit down in your living room and talk to you. But my love for this country uh, and my desire to do something to, to call the nation back to him has been bubbling up in me for a long time. And many people, when I was on the radio with American Family Radio, would call and say, and others around the country, you know, I wish you would run for president. And I would jokingly say, I would, but my wife won't let me. Uh -huh. um, and my wife finally let me, and God finally spoke to me and said, you got to take that seriously, because what you have to say, I want to be heard. So I just jumped into the fray, and, uh, and you're right, it's not an easy decision, and this hasn't been an easy walk. I've only been a candidate for now three weeks. Um, and uh, it's it. Uh, look, God doesn't tell you everything that's coming when He tells you to do something because He might scare you. <laughs> so, right, right. So, but but look, I, I am in it to win it. Um, I, I know that uh, in the natural, I look like a long shot, but with God, all things are possible. Amen, amen. Well, you know, um, at the very least, my my prayer would be that you would uh, get to. Uh, one or more of the primaries and the debates, because it could it could be cataclysmically positive if you were one of the voices on the debate stage. So, what's uh, the possibility of of that? Well, look again in the natural, it's tough because uh, we've been only in the race for three weeks, uh, and the debate is coming up in I guess two weeks. And we've got to have 40,000 discrete contributors in 20 states across the country. That means a minimum of 200 in each of those 20 states. And that's what they're requiring. And you've got to poll at, le at least 1% for the first debate. I think it's 3% for the second debate. And, and, and the challenge we're facing is, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? By the media boycotting my campaign, it makes it more difficult for people to be aware that I'm in the race. So we're believing God for a breakthrough there so that we get more media than we're getting right now. Uh, but look, I really believe the support is out there, Alex. And when people, look, I've called, Alex personally called about 400 people, and I have only had two people out of the 400 I've called say, well, I'm already committed. No, thank you. Everybody else that I talked to, oh, I'm so glad you're in the race. We need what you are bringing to the discussion to be heard. It's been, ex it's been more encouraging than I expected it to be, particularly among Christians and even among many conservatives. So uh, we're going to stay in it, and we're going to continue to push ahead and believe God to get on that debate stage at some point. Well, amen, amen. Well, our prayers are with you. And, uh, you know, um, one of the keys to the saving of this nation, you and I know, if the church were really politically engaged, uh, it could be transformative. 
Uh, George Barna, the Barna Research Group, says there are maybe 100 million adults that are born again. And yet, um, I, I was just reading a statistic, and they vary, but maybe in the last presidential election, only 40% were even registered to vote. And of the 40% registered, less than half did vote. So it looks to me like we've got a world of influence, but we're leaving it on the table and we're not, not being engaged. Um, what do you think? Is there still enough of principled people of conviction and Christian uh, courage that they could impact this nation if they would do it? Well, Alex, the prophet Isaiah said of Israel, unless the Lord had left to us a very small remnant, we would have been as Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. And I really believe that there are more believing people than even the 10 that God set as a minimum for Abraham to, uh, for Abraham when he was trying to negotiate to try to save Sodom and Gomorrah, and that God honors our prayers. When people ask me, why are you so optimistic? That's what I tell them, Alex. I tell them because I know that God hears and answers prayer. And I know that millions of Christians, even though we might be in the minority, statistically speaking, have been crying out to God in behalf of this nation. I just do not believe that God is turning a, a blind eye or a deaf ear to those prayers. I believe God is hearing them. And I really believe, as our friend Andrew Womack does, that we are already in an awakening. We're seeing the seedlings of it. And I really believe it's going to become a full-blown awakening and revival in America that's going to turn this country around in a very dramatic way. So you're, you're, a, you're a pastor. I've pastored two churches. Uh, we, you and I are very similar in a lot of ways. And, and I realize that pastors very often feel like they've got to be a, a, a diplomat. But at the same time, it's just one of the occupational hazards. Pastors are, pastors are supposed to lay the cards on the table. And uh, as, as one man said, we're to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Now, that being said, I really think where we are as a nation, morally, spiritually, uh, the breakdown of the family, the acceptance of, of deviant things, to a large degree, we have gotten to the place we are because of the silence of many yes. American pulpits. A am I right? You know, we, we have remembered our pastoral role and forgotten our prophetic role. And we have both. Wow. Yes. Um, you know, I, I tell people when they ask me about this stuff, or, well, you stay out of politics. I say, well, in heaven, when you meet Moses, be sure to correct him for having gone down into Egypt and jumped into the middle of Egyptian politics and to correct Elisha when he confronted Ahab and Jezebel and jumped into the middle of, Israel, of, of, uh, of the politics of the children of Israel and correct Nathan, who had the, the gall to go in and confront King David and tell him <laughs> that he was the man who had stolen the little ewe land. Look, and, and, and John the Baptist, and, correct and him. Correct. Correct Esther for going in before Ahasuerus yes. to save <laughs> right. the Jews from Haman. It, it is unbiblical thinking, Alex. It's just not biblical worldview thinking. And if you take the whole word of God, all the counsel of God, you realize, yes, we have a personal pastoral responsibility to our members and to individuals to try to minister to their hurts and their needs and their pains and their problems. But we've got a prophetic responsibility to the nation. I mean, my church... Our mission is very simple, threefold. Save souls, save families, save the nation. And Amen. it's that save the nation part that a lot of churches don't want to touch. So, so I had a, a caller call me day before yesterday, very upset. They've got a new pastor and uh, a younger guy. And I don't, I don't uh, look critically at uh, a man simply because he's, he's younger. We all were younger at one point. But... Um, he wouldn't have a 4th of July service and wouldn't honor the veterans as this particular church had done for decades. And he told his parishioners that he, quote, would, as long as he was pastor, he would never have any sort of God and country service because God called him to populate heaven, not save America. That was his word. So, you know, I was thinking about a litmus test, and I want to tell, I want you to tell me if you agree with this. 
I really think every pastor should be willing, maybe even eager, to be on record saying these seven things. And, and the reason I come up with these is because in one way or another, I've had people call me and they'll say that their pastor will blink or flinch on these points. Number one, Jesus is the one and only Savior. There's no way to heaven except through Jesus. Number two, the Bible is infallibly the, the perfect word of God. Uh, number three, marriage is between a man and a woman, and I'll be even more clear, marriage cannot be redefined, and it's between a biological male and a biological female. Homosexuality and transgenderism are wrong, contrary to Scripture and contrary to reality. Uh, abortion is a sin because it's the murder of a human being made in the image of God. And number six, every Christian should be patriotic because this nation uh, contributes hugely to the Great Commission and we need a free, safe, prosperous America. So patriotism is appropriate for a Christian. And number seven, a litmus test that I think any pastor should be willing to say from the pulpit, your vote is a stewardship issue. And as stewards, we are to be faithful handling the things God has entrusted to us. And when we don't vote or vote for people in positions that are anti-God, I think we'll answer for it. Now, Pastor, those seven things, is it reasonable to expect any well-paid senior pastor to be on record affirming those things? You know, Alex, I, I wanted to jump as you went through those seven things. I'm in. <laughs> I'm Amen. in. Yeah, be, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, and those are so fundamental. And, and, and let's face it, <clears throat> even Christians and pastors who agree with everything you said, then the issue becomes, are you willing to express that to your congregation? Are you willing to publicly come out and say that? Because many, we know that George Bonner also said, of the, I think, 25% of pastors in America who agree with everything you just said, only 10% of those are willing to actually publicly say it, to say it in their churches, to say it on television, wherever they have an opportunity. So there's a courage issue there too. You know, one is your conviction, your doctrinal accuracy and, and conviction. But the, but the second is your courage to express those convictions. And we really need pastors who agree with everything you've just said and then are willing to publicly say it as well. Uh, what can churches do to uh, be involved in your campaign? Well, you know, the base of my support, Alex, as you know, is in the Christian community. The media that I've gotten has been in Christian media. Uh, I need Christians to help me get on that debate stage, as you said it, so we can broaden our, our appeal and broaden our reach. And that means going to my website, I need 40,000 distinct contributors. And even if a person just gives a dollar, Alex, it helps me to get to that 40,000 so they can do that. We've got something called the 202020 Pathway to Victory. We're asking people to pray for me 20 minutes a week, that can three minutes a day. Just include, include me and include my campaign in their prayer time. Number two, give $20.24 to the campaign for 2024. And number three, talk to 20 people. And if you can't do all of that, do what you can of that, uh, because we really believe this is going to be a grassroots campaign, not funded by big, wealthy, fat cats, you know, who are pouring millions of dollars into a pack, but by average Americans who frankly see that our country is going in the wrong direction and that without God, we're not going to make it. What are some things about uh, the operation of our country that, that you think people don't know anymore and they need to be re-reminded of? See, I'm old enough, uh, Bishop, that I remember taking civics in high school. We, we had civics uh, and we learned a little bit about the government, about bills and the branches of government. But I really think people today are ignorant on those things. What, what are some key things that I think need to be restated so people can appreciate the unique government that we've been entrusted with? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, Alex, is that we are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. And our government is built to, to create it 
to limit the power of government and maximize individual liberty. And we're, we're in a stage now where particularly the Democrat Party, but I think even Republicans think any good idea you come up with, the government should, should do it. But that's not the way our country was framed, because the more you go down that path, the more individual liberty you surrender and the more power you give to government. And before you know it, you're living in a tyranny, not a constitutional republic. And I think most people don't, we hear talk, our democracy, our democracy, our democracy. And I want to say, but we're not a democracy. Exactly. So that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, and look, I would say the second thing that comes to mind is that people need to realize if we don't get our criminal justice system so that all of us have confidence that it will be fair in the enforcement of law, not based upon ideology, party, race, anything else, uh, we are headed for some very, very serious times. Because if you don't have confidence that the criminal justice system will treat you fairly, what do people have left? Defend themselves. And uh, again, that, that's the kind of thing that leads to anarchy. So I would say on my first day in office, I would fire Christopher Ray. I would clean out the Justice Department and I'd put somebody like a Matt Staver in as attorney yes. general and charge him with enforcing the law and protecting the rights of the American people. God bless you. I, now, now you're talking. Now you're talking. And uh, that, that would be great. That, that would be great. And you know what? We have to, as a nation, remember that if we don't have moral boundaries, we're going to have anarchy, lawlessness. And yeah. uh, my, my goodness, uh, so much to talk about. Well, listen, we're almost out of time. Give your website again. How can people find you online? It's E.W. Jackson for president.com. And all letters, no numbers, no dots. E.W. Jackson for president.com. And they can go there, volunteer, give, and pray for us. You are an inspiration. And I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, E.W. Jackson, thank folks, you. thank you for uh, watching the program. Stay with us. When we come back, I want to give some practical ways that, yes, your church scripturally and constitutionally can be involved in influencing others and being salt and light, a preservative force for our nation currently at risk. Stay tuned. We're back after this. Wow, I cannot say enough about the Karis experience. This is the best decision of my life. God is calling you here. He's going to help you. He's going to lead you in the right direction. You'll see the heart of Andrew. You'll see the heart of all the instructors. And the Lord will speak to you if you come. If you are desiring to come to Bible college, then you have a word from the Lord. God has something for you. Here, come. <laughs> Do you know what is the longest international boundary in the world between two countries? It's the boundary between the U.S. and Canada, 5,250 miles. And each nation keeps the trees cleared. It's even visible from 30,000 feet in the air. The boundary, it's called the slash, the border between the U.S. and Canada. In other words, there's a clear delineation between two things. And I think about that, that's like the delineation between a church involved and a church in retreat. Part of the reason our nation is in the state that it's in is because the church has retreated. And as I talked about with E.W. Jackson, pastors have been silent. I call on pastors. Look, I've, I've pastored and I'm in churches every weekend. We pastors must use our influence to speak and say, look, as I said, the, the seven litmus tests, there's no savior but Jesus. The Bible is God's word. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Abortion is a sin. Transgenderism and homosexuality are wrong. And yes, patriotism is appropriate for a Christian. The churches must speak about the preservation of the nation. And a vote is a stewardship issue. Come on, pastors, get some courage, get some conviction and use this window of opportunity to make a difference. Tell your parishioners, look, if you vote for ungodly people, you'll answer to God for it. Don't waste your vote when we could preserve our nation and as a stable, prosperous, safe, 
America, we can have the wherewithal to participate in the Great Commission. 100 million Christians, a half million clergy, 345,000 churches. Look, we've got better market saturation than Starbucks and McDonald's combined, but we're not using it. And we could be like the Mount of Olives, a place of truth and light, but we're like a place of corruption because we're silent and we're unengaged. Folks, let's get in gear. Let's get involved. And it begins with you and me. I can't account for what somebody else might do, but I can account for my own obedience. And so as an individual, pray, stay equipped, influence others, make a difference. And as always, we say this so many times, I'll say it again. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 58, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You really do make a difference. And I thank you for standing strong for truth and for staying bold. Let's do it. Let's make a difference. I just returned from a conference at The Cove and it was absolutely breathtaking in every way. The mountain views, the tranquil areas within the woods and just being alone with God. Mornings spent watching the sunrise from a rocking chair with coffee in one hand and my Bible in the other. Evenings spent reflecting on the incredible spiritual teaching. It's the embodiment of peacefulness. Come and experience The Cove for yourself. Wow, what an exciting year it's being. What an exciting summer. As we film the show, we've just finished the sixth of seven summer camps. And by the time this airs, more than 1,200 teenagers will have been through our biblical worldview camps. In fact, I want to play you some audio, and I'll explain what this is. Listen to 130 teens in a camp session. They said, we are the generation who will restore America. You know, when these kids get back from camp, they start viral truth clubs, our conferences, our broadcasts, our publishing. Folks, you're helping us do that. Thousands are coming to Christ. Young people are saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and they're committing to be an influence for the good. So thanks for praying. Please help us. My 20th book, releases September 6, 2023. It's 100 Bible questions and answers for families. And if you would give a support gift of at least $50, a tax-deductible gift of at least $50 to Alex McFarland Ministries, I'm going to send you a brand new copy of this book. If you would today, you can give securely online or you can write to us at P.O. Box 485 Pleasant Garden, North Carolina 27313. Please pray and financially support. 